In the news today, there was a conflict between uh, three men and a woman. And uh, during that conflict, um, the woman was killed and one of the men was scratched. Uh, the woman, woman apparently was associated with the radical group Me Too. Um, when the Prime Minister was asked, he said the woman scratched the men when she was being assaulted and the men definitely have the right to defend themselves. Okay, now that obviously is a fantasy story. Um, I thought I would clarify that because that's probably a bit too close to reality for a number of people. The parallel I'm trying to draw is, is with Palestine, obviously. The situation there, which is always called the conflict, never ever looks at the disproportionate uh, power of the parties, nor does it ever look at the history, just as uh, stories of assault don't really look at the history of patriarchy. Self-defense cannot be seen in uh, isolation from the, the disproportionate levels of power involved, nor can it be seen out of the context of the events that has led up to the violence. In the history of Palestine, we have a situation in which European Jews were being um, harassed and subject to prejudice, subject to violence, and so on, all over Europe. The Third Reich was one of the more egregious and horrific examples of that, but the situation of anti-Semitism in Europe was certainly not limited to Germany, with the bigotry in the UK, the bigotry elsewhere in Europe. This is a long-standing situation in Europe where there have been waves of anti-Semitism directed at uh, Jewish people. So the Zionist movement arose out of that. It went to the British who had recently taken over the uh, area of Palestine from the Ottoman Turks. They sought to propitiate the um, Zionists in part in the hopes that the Jews would leave England. The UK had its own fascist movement, and so they thought they could assist with all of this through the Balfour Agreement, in which they granted a homeland to the Zionists in Palestine. The British will point to the Balfour Agreement and the parts of that that say the Jewish people should live with and at peace with the Arab population there. They will claim that uh, the Balfour Agreement was an agreement that Jewish people could move to the area and be seen as citizens, but it was not intended to create a Jewish state. The Zionists clearly intended to create a Jewish state. I'm certain that the English were not so ignorant or naive to believe otherwise. There was a great deal of uh, discussion um, within the Jewish community, pro and con about this. Without getting into the history of the situation here, I will just say that when the Jewish people began to move back to Israel, there was a huge push by the Zionists to get as many Jewish people into Israel as they possibly could, with the intention of ultimately outnumbering the Arab inhabitants who were already there and had been living there basically since pre-biblical times. The push for Jews to migrate to Israel was assisted in Europe 
by the bigotry that Jewish people had faced within Europe for centuries uh, and with the rise of Germany and also the rise of fascism in England and other European countries. In the Arabic countries it was more difficult because Jewish people had for over a thousand years found a far more congenial welcome in Arabic countries. The Moorish kingdoms in Spain uh, welcomed Jews. Jews had been ex excluded under the Holy Roman Empire from Jerusalem when the Arabs took over in uh, 1638, I think. The, one of the first things they did was invite the Jews back in, which was the first time that they had been, been allowed back into Jerusalem. Um, from the time that the Romans had banned them in 70 AD. So for 600 and something years, they had been banned from Jerusalem. When the Arabs conquered uh, Jerusalem, they were invited back in and permitted back in. And so were the Christians. The Muslims believed that all people of the book were entitled to come to Jerusalem. Some of the largest populations of Jewish people were in Middle Eastern countries, in places like Baghdad. And while there had been various tensions, uh, as in any area where there are separate and distinct ethnic groups, um, Jewish people had been involved in government and had had you know, high-ranking positions in government for quite some time. The purpose of uh, the Zionists was to create tension. They did this by creating false flag attacks and, um, and so on. There was also the exacerbating uh, situation where the British, in payment for the Hashemite assistance to T. Lawrence during World War I, had agreed to give Hashemite um, princes the rulership of independent states within the Middle East. And they put in some of these Hashemite princes in charge of Syria when the French staged a revolution to take back Syria. And they put him in as monarch in Iraq. You, know, you have to understand that with the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire after World War I and the setting up of mandates under the League of Nations, one of the rules of the mandate was that these European colonial powers were able to manage the country until the country could manage itself. It could prove that it was capable of its own management. And one of the designs of the colonial powers was therefore to create a situation where any of the newly defined nations, their borders included disparate groups, ethnic groups, to ensure that there would be tension. So Iraq included both Sunni and Shia Muslims and Kurds and Assyrians. This created some tension for other minority groups. And the Zionists capitalized on that. They also sought to bring in Jewish people from Yemen, from Morocco, from all over the world. The stories are complex and often uh, it was not um, done in a, in, in a very open or honest way. As the Zionists began to increase the Jewish population, uh, the Arabs felt a certain amount of threat, but it wasn't really until the um, Israelis uh, started pushing people out of towns and so on that tensions um, developed into an open conflict. And this resulted in the 48 um, division of Israel and Palestine. And Israel basically invaded these things and, and those areas became the occupied territory. The occupied territories have since that time been systematically depopulated of, of Arab people in a form of ethnic cleansing. The major 
depopulation, of course, occurred in the Nakba, the disaster, when whole villages were bulldozed, people were pushed into the sea, and something like 700,000 Pal Arab Palestinians were displaced and driven out of their own land. And many of those ended up in Gaza. Uh, many of them ended up in refugee camps in Jordan or in Lebanon or elsewhere. But the effort by the Zionists was to drive them out and began to try and take over greater Israel. If you look at some of the early flags of the various Zionist factions included both Palestine and uh, Israel and also parts of Lebanon and Syria and uh, fairly large swaths of Jordan. They made huge efforts and have continually made efforts to displace Palestinians after that point. After the Nakba and, and the displacement of 700,000 Palestinians, those Palestinians that remained have been displaced with Israelis uh, coming in and knocking down houses, building settler camps. Uh, the UN, of course, has said that this is illegal and it must be stopped in resolution after resolution after resolution after resolution. And other than that, those resolutions, the situation has been ignored. Western countries have supported Israel, most notably the U.S. has supported Israel. Um, Israel has basically taken the, uh, the role that Egypt held um, before World War I, where the British held Egypt and therefore con could control the Suez Canal and had a foothold in the Middle East. Um, now Israel could take that place because Egypt had become independent. The uh, push against the Palestinians just proceeded and proceeded and proceeded with crime after crime after crime, with houses being firebombed, uh, people being burned alive, um, the Israelis set up a legal situation where the Palestinians suffer under huge uh, inequality, both in the occupied territory, which is under control of Israel, and in Israel itself, where the so-called Arab Palestinian people, who are actually part of Israel and Israeli citizens, are second-class citizens, and it's lately been um, made explicit that only Jewish citizens will have full rights. And of course, anybody coming from anywhere in the world who is Jewish can claim citizenship in Israel. So we end up having settlers coming in from the United States. They have immediate um, citizenship in Israel and can immediately go into Palestine and uh, settle there. And, and take land from the Palestinians. Gaza has, of course, become basically an open-air prison, as it has been described. There are walls around it that has been blockaded. Uh, people have a difficult time going out even fishing. There is no trade allowed. There is uh, a difficulty getting cement or any kind of building material. Mm -hmm. Refugee camps have just developed into cities. There's heaps of information about that online. Anybody who wants to know can see. And in this situation of continual oppression, both legal oppression, um, what we would call systemic oppression, within Israel and within the occupied territory, and actual physical oppression where people's houses are, uh, are destroyed, where people are burned alive in their homes, where periodically the Israelis bomb the hell out of Gaza and destroy infrastructure, destroy their water sources, their power, and so on, while they are held captive by the uh, blockades. We have a situation where crime after crime after crime after crime after crime, and we have a situation in Jerusalem in which Israel is trying to drive out any Palestinians who remain there. And 
We also have the situation in East Jerusalem, where, which is an occupied zone where they're trying to drive out the uh, Palestinians there, although it is the so-called Arab zone. A lot of the people who are there um, have been uh, moved there in a situation reminiscent of the um, situation in India, where Pakistan and India were both formed as separate nations and suddenly um, Hindus were being thrown out of what was now Pakistan and uh, Muslims were being thrown out of what is now India and huge violence went on. In a situ similar situation, Arab um, Palestinians who had been driven out of what was now Israeli um, Jerusalem moved to the so-called Arab part the, of uh, East Jerusalem. Um, and there were Israeli people or Jewish people who moved out of that area into uh, West Jerusalem. Now the Israelis are saying they want to recover all of the property of all of the Jews who uh, lived there. And that means displacing people who have lived there for 50 years who were displaced from their own homes and moved there uh, during this division and occupation. And this is one of the flashpoints that is occurring now as Israel is trying to eliminate the Palestinian population of East Jerusalem, um, forcibly moving uh, Palestinian people out of their homes, homes that they've lived in for half a century or more, and installing um, settlers, people who've come in from New York, as you can see in some of the uh, viral footage that's available on the internet. At the same time, you have settler marches marching through East Jerusalem and other parts of Jerusalem yelling, kill the Arabs um, in their annual flag celebration or Jerusalem Day celebration, which is a celebration of the occupation of Palestine and driving out 700,000 Palestinians. So this is not only uh, an affront to any remaining Palestinians, but the fact that these people are yelling, kill the Arabs, kill the Arabs, um, is threatening. And so obviously there's going to be some reaction. Uh, at the same time, the military has been attacking the Al-Aqsa Mosque, the Al-Aqsa Mosque being the third holiest place in Islam during Ramadan, just before Eid. Um, they've come in with uh, military and so on, with grenades, flashbangs, and so on, and assaulted people who were praying. Uh, you can say that, you know, it's always the excuse that there are, you know, militants maybe there somewhere. This has you know, created a reaction. Basically, people, Palestinian people, who have had this going on for over half a century, crime after crime after crime, people killed, people shot in the street, children arrested, children imprisoned, children killed. The, the crimes are so incredibly uh, manifest and multiplied you know, against uh, a population that is essentially defenseless. Yeah, you know, the they talk about you know the Palestinians throwing rocks, yeah, you know, while the Israeli soldiers have AK forty sevens. There are pictures of people who are just you know in the street taken down and shot in the head. There are pictures of of children being brutalized. Yeah, you know, th there are there's so much footage available of the crimes against humanity engaged in by Israel. And of course, the Israeli government makes it legal. And Palestine has never been recognized as a state. And so Palestine is, is in a situation where it has very little 
international legal recourse. The Palestinians have tried to make their case and make uh, the world aware of what these things are going ha have happened. They've tried fighting back. The Israelis have overwhelming force that they can bring to bear, bear on any kind of Palestinians. And they always strike not only at anybody who you know, might be involved in actual protests, they will strike at the homes, the families, the children of Palestinian people. They want to create such a, a situation of terror that no resistance would be conceivable. This is their goal. They've stated that kind of goal. They, they want to create a situation where any kind of resistance will be met with an overwhelming reaction. And so here we see you know, Palestinians faced with this situation of, of during the holiest time of the year, one of their holiest mosques being invaded by Israeli soldiers, being continually displaced from their homes in East Jerusalem, which is supposed to be Palestinian anyway, being uh, assaulted, being uh, having having marches through their their areas, calling death to the Arabs, and and you know they have tried, they have tried to fight back. They have tried peaceful means. They have tried educating the world. They have tried, you know, peaceful protests. Nothing works. And so young Palestinians, you know, fight back. I mean, basically, when somebody is under threat, even if, you know, at, at a certain point, you don't care anymore. You know, you're being killed. You know, you will fight back. Even though you know you will almost certainly lose, you will fight back. And so people have fought back. And now we see again the Israelis destroying Gaza. Yeah. Um, one of the first things they've done is destroy, I, I understand they've, they've knocked down three high-rise buildings um, housing the international press. This is Reuters, the AP, Al Jazeera, and so on, because they do not want reporting they they want to you know, basically destroy anything that the Palestinians have. The AP and 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 Al Jazeera building. I think this is the last. It's the third most recent of the building. It was a twelve-story building that was just utterly destroyed um, with all of their equipment and so on. Uh, a number of Palestinian families had moved into the upper floors because they thought they might be safe in a building housing the international press. Clearly that wasn't the case, and they have lost everything. Imagine, you know, even if you escape the building itself, you know, to have lost in, in a situation where, you know, you are in an open-air prison uh, which is under siege and under blockade and you know there is huge amounts of poverty where medical supplies aren't available and so on uh, in the middle of a pandemic you know you are forced you have your home obliterated and you lose everything all of the photos of your children, anything that you have managed to put together, radios, televisions, carpets, beds, furniture, all of it is gone. Yeah, all of your clothes that, that you weren't wearing is gone. And if you're lucky, all of your family managed to escape. The journalists in this, in this last building have, have talked about the fact that they have been there for, for five years. They know all of the families who are there, and they know that you know, they are friendly with them, and they know that Hamas was not there. You know, of course, the Israelis say, oh, oh, there was a Hamas base there. You know, there were people firing rockets. No, there weren't. You know, the media um, 
reporters and journalists who are there say they know all of the people who were in that building and they're absolutely certain none of them were involved in any kind of Hamas thing. There were no militants who came in there. They just destroyed the building because it was a media hub. And the Western media keeps reporting this as a conflict, as if it was two-sided. It's not two-sided. The Americans keep talking about the Israeli, you know, right to self-defense. Questioned, they will, they will, you know, try any kind of evasive waffling to avoid saying Palestinians have a right to self-defense because clearly they believe Palestinians have no right to self-defense. They believe that Palestinians should just be crushed. Yeah. It, it, they come in and talk about wanting to, to negotiate a ceasefire. They don't talk about wanting to negotiate justice. They don't talk about wanting to negotiate an end to the occupation of Palestine. They don't talk about wanting to, to pay attention to the UN resolutions that say this is a crime. They don't pay attention to Human Rights Watch. They don't pay attention to the uh, International Criminal Court. You know, they don't pay attention to anyone other than the Israelis. And asked and pursued. We've seen footage of, of American um, press secretaries, government press secretaries and so on, you know, being questioned, you know, don't Palestinians have a right to defend themselves? And they waffle and they use weasel words like, and, and no offense to the weasels, they, they use these, these things where they say, oh, well, every state has a right to defend itself knowing full well that one of the problems for Palestine is, you know, they haven't had been recognized as a state by, I think they have been by China, they have been by a few places, but they're not recognized generally as a state, and so this is an out. But self-defense, the principle of self-defense, if you are assaulting somebody and they fight back and you kill them, you cannot claim that is self-defense. And it is not just states that have a right to self-defense. We all have a right to self-defense. It is, you know, the U.S. is such a corrupt place. You know, they have warped the notion of self-defense to the extent that they allow you know, people to just shoot black and brown people on the idea that they might have been a threat. This is not self-defense. You know, that's murder. When you have huge inequalities of power and one group is oppressing and violating and, and harming another, and that other group fights back, it is the group that's fighting back that is defending themselves. The group that are attacking them are not defending themselves. The U.S. is not defending itself when it goes to the other side of the world and blows up villages and shoots children and shoots grandparents in Afghanistan or Vietnam or anywhere else. They've warped this notion and now they're applying it to Israel. They think Israel can get away with the same rubbish. It is not self-defense. This is not a conflict, this is a genocide. This is ethnic cleansing. Yeah. In its best situation, Israel is an apartheid state. In its worst situation, it is a genocidal state. And you only need to listen to the settler groups calling for the death to Arabs. This is the same mindset that allowed Nazi Germany to rise. Yeah, I'm not saying the Jews are Nazis. Yeah, I want to make that clear. But I want to say that the mindset that leads people to, to run through the streets you know, in, in an Arab area and say death to Arabs is exactly the same mindset that allowed people to countenance 
you know, the removal of Jewish people in Germany to concentration camps. Israel is wonderful with, you know, phrases like never again, but never again, does that mean never again will Israel ever put up with any resistance? Or does never again mean never again should anyone anywhere countenance genocide against any people? Nazi Germany arose in part because people in Europe allowed it. People in Europe and America are allowing the genocide of the Palestinians. They are collaborators. They are facilitators. They sell them the weapons. They, France bans protests against Israel. When the Palestinians try one of the last possible peaceful means of resistance, the boycott, divestment, and sanction movement, to say people have the opportunity to, with free speech, try and convince people not to support Israel. They try to frame that as anti-Semitism and make it illegal. And state after state in the United States has actually done this. You know, other countries have done this. They, they try to make BDS illegal. But what is that other than a popular protest using argument using free speech to try and convince people not to support genocide. It's disgusting what's going on. And everybody, everybody everywhere needs to resist this. They need to get out in the street. They need to write your governments. You need to protest. You need to you know, engage and, in, and embrace BDS. Because truly, when nonviolent protests like BDS are made impossible, violence becomes inevitable. And that does not justify genocide. And when you are an oppressive power who is occupying another country and displacing people from their homes and bombing them and imprisoning them, you, know, you cannot claim you are defending yourself against those people. You cannot. It's a lie. We all need to support Palestine at this time. We all need to do everything we can and not stop. Even if they manage to have a ceasefire, it doesn't change anything. The Israeli government will continue along this path of ethnic cleansing. It will continue with its assaults, daily assaults, with the structural uh, oppression, with the apartheid notion, where the, with the inequality, the creation of second-class citizens within its borders, the oppression of people um, in the occupied territories, and oppression of people all over the world who are trying to you know, bring up this. And it is not a case of anti-Semitism because there's nothing wrong with Jewish people. There are Jewish people who are opposing what Israel do, does. It's not about Jewish people. A lot of the people in Israel may be ethnically Jewish, but they are not religious Jews. They are uh, secular. They don't really care about Judaism. They see themselves as an ethnic group who want to cleanse um, their area of a different ethnic group, one that has lived there for thousands of years. What is going on in Gaza right now? Uh, they used to do the so-called roof tapping and warning of people. Um, this time they're, they've decided not to. They're just blowing up buildings in the middle of the night. Uh, there is no warning. These are homes. These are the only homes people have. Um, <laughs> these are, uh, you, you see situations where, you know, a doctor will be in the hospital and find that his entire family has been wiped out 
in one of these bombs. Yes, the situation in Gaza is, is horrible. Uh, of course, hospitals have been deprived of any kind of medical supplies through the blockade for decades. And this is in a time of COVID where you have that situation as well. And you're making people homeless and forcing them to crowd into bomb shelters. And of course, nobody has vaccines or anything like that. You know, and, and the bombing is occurring against refugee camps. Yeah. You know, and uh, against a nunnery, you know, as well as against these media outlets. You know, what is going on there is horrific. Gaza is one of the most crowded places in the world, and it is walled in. And it is blocked by sea by naval blockades. You know, the people cannot escape. There is nowhere to go. And half of the people in Gaza are children. They keep claiming, you know, they're using children as human shields. You know, know that there are children there. They don't, people don't use their children as human shields. Nobody does that. What's going on is disgusting. We all need to be fighting. My heart is, is absolutely with the people in Palestine. Uh, Israel needs to be stopped. It needs to be brought to account. There needs to be efforts to make sure no more weapons get sent to Israel. I understand you know, that dock workers in Israel have um, prevented a shipload of arms from uh, going to Israel. You know, Israel gets $10 million a day from the United States, mostly for weapons. It needs to stop. It needs to stop. It is beyond disgusting what's going on there. It is one of the worst abuses in the world. It is you know, only one of the horrific abuses, but it is one of the worst and, and it is most active right now. This doesn't mean that you know, the situation in Yemen is, is any less horrible. The um, situation in Yemen is, of course, another situation where a massively powerful nation is trying to destroy what is basically a liberation movement trying to fight against a puppet government. And it is also being fueled by the U.S. empire. And the U.S. empire is still in Iraq. And the U.S. empire is still in Syria. And the U.S. empire is still in Afghanistan. And the U.S. empire drops drones on Pakistan. And the U.S. empire is all across Africa. And the U.S. empire is doing its very best to create a war with China. And countries like Australia, my country, supports the U.S narratives and efforts all the way down the line and everywhere we need to stop this we need to stop this empire but at this time particularly we need to stand with the palestinians we need to educate people we need to get out there and make sure people know that the narrative they are fed by mainstream media media is rubbish I stand with Palestine. Thank you for anybody who's listening to this. Please do whatever you can. It's tragic. It's heartbreaking. Yeah. If you want any evidence of that, there is more than enough. As somebody said, ignorance is no longer any kind of excuse. If you say you don't know what's really going on, or you don't know which side is right or not. What you're really saying is you don't care and you are happy for this to continue. Okay, well, that's it from me, from Life is a Leaf. Please follow Faint Signals from Vega. Uh, they've put out a lot of stuff. Please follow The Empire Files. Please follow the electronic intifada. Please get your information from non-Western sources. World Bulletin often has good information. That's the Turkish main newspaper. Uh, Al Jazeera sometimes has decent stuff. Um, mostly you can find a lot of stuff 
being shared on Twitter and on the internet. Okay, stay safe, uh, do everything you can. There's no excuse for not raising your voice, for not moving into action now. Okay, thanks a lot. Bye.